Our next speaker is the focus that has brought this community together, going a thousand directions to say we could do this because this is attractive to make a difference, not only for here, but for our two countries and for the entire world. So, uh, Secretary Burson, it's our great, great pleasure and honor to have you here to, to address us. Good morning, uh, Senor Presidente, Senor Fiscal, uh, Dr. Frost, the San Diego State community and distinguished guests, um, this is a, a good place to uh, have this discussion, and I'm honored by the presence of all of you because you live at, that, uh, at the edge of that uh, pointy spear where the future is being built, where it's uh, not yet uh, clear, uh, but you are out uh, pointing the way to a, a way of seeing and a manner of uh, there afterwards operating that will change the world. And it is altogether fitting and proper that we do it here in the Viz Center uh, and in your uh, presence. What I'd like to do today is um, actually start uh, the, the basis for a further dialogue. And in the course of uh, reviewing uh, where we are, uh, perhaps uh, provide a glimpse into uh, future discussion and future uh, debate and analysis. It's interesting to uh, consider the uh, time, uh, not only the space in which we look at, uh, at these issues, in the uh, transformation of Mexico, perhaps with the possible exception of China and uh, India, the greatest transformation going on in the world uh, today, happening right uh, here uh, at, uh, in Baja, California, hasta Chiapas, a transformation in, in a nation of 110, uh, 112 million people, a nation that in 2043 will have an economy larger than Germany, and some years after that, a, an economy larger than Japan, a, a place where the demographics of Mexico, in accordance with the historical uh, operation of the Industrial Revolution now finds itself with a birth rate that is now 2.1 rather than the 6.7 of a generation ago, with enormous implications for the border, with the disappearance of that bulge of young people between 16 and 28 which arguably in the last four decades has done so much to build the United States. It is a, an enormously interesting time uh, to be alive. Fifty years ago, Thomas Kuhn, K-U-H-N, and I say this for the benefit of graduate students, but also for all of us, wrote a book called The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. And it was a book that uh, looked at the epistemology of how do we know and how do we learn in science. And it actually reversed traditional ways of seeing science from thinking that there is a logical progression in the way in which we built up our scientific knowledge. That in fact, uh, when there was a, an anomaly that could not be explained by a prevailing theory, the assumption was that the anomaly was an anomaly and would need to be incorporated into the existing way of seeing. And what Kuhn shows, and it is a book worth reading, having just read it again myself, to explain how scientific and, by extension, other modes of uh, thinking change. And what Kuhn said, uh, in essence, was that uh, the anomalies uh, actually are the uh, key to understanding uh, the need for a new development of theory. And that when you uh, then find a way of seeing that can explain uh, the anomaly, it leads to an entirely uh, different uh, paradigm. 
paradigm was a term that he developed 50 years ago. It's now uh, more or less a hackneyed term, but it is a useful term in understanding uh, the way in which each age develops a way of seeing, an understanding, a lens through which we take the sensory data flooding us and we make sense of it and we begin to explain the way in which the world works. I usually give the example of uh, the first such way of seeing uh, developed by Ptolemy in which he thought that the earth was the center of the universe and how it affected people who were living thousands of years before the common era how it affected the way in which they conducted their lives and among other things he points out that how else could you uh, have the uh, pyramids at Giza what could possibly be the conception of Egyptians in that age that would lead them to build something put aside how they built it to build something of that stature and then the impact of the Copernican uh, a way of seeing that uh, placed the earth in better context as one part of a solar system part of a much larger universe and how that damped down the arrogance and the hubris of human beings as they assumed a different uh, view of where we fit into the cosmos and then what Kuhn does it takes it through the Newtonian age and so on but let me uh, focus on the contemporary age which is the age of uncertainty the age of relativity uh, introduced by Einstein in which uh, so suddenly there were no absolutes suddenly everything was relative and how it affected the way in which uh, the world develops not only in terms of science and this is the insight from Kuhn that most influenced the way in which I uh, so sociology and political science and history is that uh, if you look at the contemporary world and you take uh, postmodern art or six-tone music and you think about that contrasted to Renaissance art uh, or classical art you begin to see how all of this actually reflects a way of seeing a lens uh, that has its implications for not only science but for art uh, some would say for most postmodern politics uh, and now in the world of globalization uh, we, we struggle to as we feel comfortable with the way in which the Viz Center is trying to link the world for communication purposes taking fragmentation and beginning to try to bring some order to it through a way of seeing. It is the job of universities and intellectuals to actually do the thought engineering that will make it possible to integrate uh, all of these data into usable information and then into theories of action that form the basis for activities and policies uh, which in turn feed back into the loop of politics and decision making. What Lines and Flows attempted to do was to take a concept that I had in my professional life always assumed uh, was a static, which it was if you think back to my first encounter with the border in 1993 in which the border was the first line of defense in which consistently in history people had used the border as a place of fortification and defense against the unknown against the outside against the enemy against those who are not part of the tribe and that's in fact the way in which borders operated for most of uh, human history and, and in fact the southwest border fence 
is uh, in ways not so different from the impetus that led to the building of the Great Wall in the second century before Christ in China. Not so far from the Siegfried Line built by the Nazis after conquering Western Europe. Not so different at all from the Soviets' construction of the Berlin Wall. Keeping things and people out and or keeping things and people in. Globalization has turned that paradigm on its head. And we begin to see not only here in the data of communication, in the digitized world of bits, but we see it in the massive flows of cargo and the massive flows of people taking place daily across the planet as a matter of routine not an extraordinary occurrence. So the notion of flows was an effort to uh, build in fluidity in place of static concepts of border, both physically and intellectually. But we in the Western world have a fondness for dichotomy, something that uh, East Asia long ago rejected. So the notion was not to replace borders as lines with borders as flows and to dispense with one, but rather in the manner of Kuhn to incorporate the two concepts and to attempt to find a synthesis that would help us explain the world as it is today as a prelude to reacting to it and to beginning to change it. So from that attempt to synthesize comes a, an effort to reconcile, find the common ground between traditionally perceived dichotomies. The first one that Dr. Frost has seized with such energy characteristic of him, is the dichotomy between trade and security. When we started the Trusted Traveler program in San Diego in 1995, the Century program, the notion was that security and trade facilitation were mutually exclusive. Indeed, that they were antithetical that if you achieve greater movement of legitimate trusted travelers or trade, by definition, you would have a decrease in the security that would accompany the transaction. And that's the paradigm under which we operated. More security, by definition, commerce suffered. 9 11 brought that home in a dramatic way when in fact the sense of the violation of US borders led to a retreat instinctively to the borders as lines of defense which led to a virtual shutting down not only of our land borders but of our seaports and our airports Many of you will remember the Tijuana-San Diego border, Puerto de Mexico and San Isidro in the aftermath of 9-11. Six, seven, eight hour waits as every trunk was opened as in fact CBP officers were required to accomplish. But it was consistent with this notion that our borders had been violated and we needed to protect ourselves from dangerous people and dangerous things. So instinctively, as the security quotient rose, the facilitation element diminished. And it soon became clear that that was not workable in the global world we live in. A world in which, just looking at the United States alone, 60,000 containers enter our 
by rail and sea and air and truck every day. One million persons are processed through the ports of entry at airports and seaports and land ports. 270,000 private vehicles enter the United States from the northern border and the southern border every day. A massive flow that could not handle this notion that we would look at each person and each vehicle in an equal fashion. So slowly what began to develop was how do we actually reconcile security and trade. And we've done it with quite a lot of progress in the last 10 years based on several theorems that are discussed in the paper. The first is that uh, when you uh, approach flows, you must actually have a sense of threat and a, a common operating picture of what are the potential risks that you face with regard to any particular traveler or any particular cargo. And then you actually begin to manage that risk. And you do that by gathering information about the flows, the cargo, and the persons. And then you begin to make judgments about the level of risk presented by those persons or those things. And then you implement a segmentation of that traffic according to risk. And then you begin to see that facilitating lawful traffic and lawful commerce and lawful travel is actually essential to security. Because at any particular allocation of security resources, no matter how many Border Patrol agents or CBP officers or aduaneros that you have at the line, you cannot actually do the security function unless you separate out the lawful traffic and the lawful trade and you move that forward quickly so that you can devote your resources and your attention to the higher risk cargoes or the higher risk persons or the persons or cargoes about which you lack sufficient information to make a judgment about the level of risk presented by their transit or by their importation. The analogy that uh, brings this home is that of the haystack. If 98% of the traffic and the trade is actually lawful and legitimate, which it is, finding the high-risk person and the high-risk cargo is like trying to find a needle in a haystack. And the way in which you find a needle in a haystack is actually by depending on intelligence, as one means, where you get very specific information about where the needle is and you reach into the haystack and you pluck it out. And indeed, that's what happened in October 2010 when Saudi Arabian intelligence authorities informed intelligence authorities here and elsewhere that Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula had actually packed two printer cartridges with PETN and that the explosives were set to detonate in cargo planes over Chicago. And then in an amazing demonstration of partnership, more later on the essential critical element of partnership, the private sector and the public sector was able to reach into the global supply chain of millions of packages and literally pluck out those two on a FedEx plane and in Dubai, where a Qatar Airlines had carried the cargo en route uh, to uh, UPS uh, Depot and into the UPS global travel and cargo system. While intelligence, as my friends at Northcom know, is improving, we still do not have enough timely intelligence to pluck out the needles with regularity. For that reason, the second method of finding a needle in a haystack uh, 
is to make the haystack smaller. And that's where the segmentation of low risk traffic and travelers is absolutely essential to raising the security level at any particular resource allocation point. And the rest of uh, the synthesis between security and trade grows from that insight. What I'd like to do uh, this morning is, is actually uh, in the interest of uh, stimulating further, further dialogue because at some point in the future as students here and elsewhere take concepts of lines and flows and synthesis of irreconcilable or previously perceived to be irreconcilable dichotomies, I look forward to the day when lines and flows is read by a first grader in Karachi because it is such a primitive elementary statement of the proposition. In a world of threat assessment, risk management, traffic segmentation, the key, as demonstrated by the workings of the VIS Center, the key is actually data sharing and partnership among entities and between sectors to share information. Because the key to risk management is knowing and the key to knowing is to have usable information that grows from an accumulation, an aggregation of data to make usable information. The internet has uh, multiplied our capacity to do this beyond anything that might have been imagined even 10 years ago when the internet was well known. What I'd like to uh, address with you today is the importance of uh, reconciling in this context notions of privacy and civil liberties with information sharing. Because in fact we have a huge clash and divergence between the point of view on the one hand that says we cannot share information because we in fact then violate the rights of privacy of travelers or logisticians or importers or exporters and we violate the civil liberties of those who have not entrusted that information to governmental authorities or NGOs in the private non-government sector. It is the largest obstacle to sharing aside from traditional stovepipe senses of keep the information which is pursuant to a, a, uh, another paradigm that is actually anachronistic. That is what we have all learned at the knees of our mothers and fathers, uncles and aunts, which is that information is power. And indeed, information is power. But the lesson that was drawn in the past generation was that because information is power, the point is to hoard it, not to share it. And the concept being that if you have information, you want to require others to come to you and negotiate for that information by giving you something in return. Uh, actually, uh, to the contrary, in the digital world, environment. You increase your power by comparing your information and the data that forms the basis of it with other people's information so that you can actually connect the dots. It is a complete reversal of the way in which we think about the relationship between data, information, and power. What we need to do now is actually to demonstrate that privacy is actually a boon to security. And here's the argument in its infancy. So I urge you to uh, help me uh, think this through and improve it. 
after the Yemen cargo plot of 2010, the usual bureaucratic political response to that, as it had been after 9-11, understandably, was that uh, legislative bodies, the Congress in this case, would have imposed a requirement after 9-11 those of you engaged in the importing business know about the 10 plus 2 requirement, which is that every time a cargo freighter is laded in Shanghai or in Singapore, before it is laded, if it is in intended to be imported into the United States, the cargo must, uh, the, the shipper must send to U.S. authorities elements about destination, content, and the way in which the container is being laded. The 10 plus 2 requirement that was opposed by the private sector vehemently and over the last decade actually has been worked through in dialogue between the private sector and the public sector. But in the aftermath of the air cargo plot, the concept was, let us not operate that way, but rather let us bring together the private sector and the public sector so that we can develop a regime that would provide more security without interfering with the global supply chain. And an amazing uh, development took place. Uh, the Air Cargo Advanced Screening, ACAS, uh, was developed by the express carriers, UPS, FedEx, TNT, and DHL that carry 70% of the air cargo in the global supply chain. And together, the private sector and the public sector worked out the ACAS arrangement, which involves the grand bargain of advance information. And this is the beginning of the reconciliation of privacy, confidentiality, and security. And what the agreement was basically was if you provide information in exchange about what is being loaded into the air cargo compartment and you do it in advance, well, the government will make two promises reciprocally, reciprocally in return. The first is that the information will be maintained in confidence and used only for the purpose for which it was given which is security and the expediting of lawful traffic. And the second promise is that uh, the traffic, once established to be low risk, would be expedited. And that grand bargain is actually now accounted for an amazing uh, demonstration of its utility. So. A year and a half before October 2010, I happened uh, then as Commissioner of Customs and Border Protection to be at Kennedy Airport. And I went to visit the DHL cargo depot at Kennedy. And I asked a middle-level manager why, uh, in fact, DHL was not sharing information about the cargo in advance of the four hours that were required by law under U.S. law, in the air context, you, need, you needed to provide manifest elements to governmental authorities four hours before arrival in the United States, or if you were less than four hours from a port of entry in the United States, you needed to do it at wheels up of the aircraft. And uh, this manager uh, said uh, quite forthrightly, the reason we don't share information with you, even though we have it well in advance, is that if we gave it to you early, you would simply inspect more of our cargo. The dichotomy between trade and security. The reflexive notion that they were mutually exclusive. What ACAS has actually demonstrated is that most of the cargo being carried within that 70% is highly predictable. That is to say, within the very sophisticated systems of the express air carriers, they know weeks in advance in some cases, no less than a week in advance in virtually all cases, what 
the elements of information are about that particular cargo. And they could easily share that with governmental authorities. Once the grand bargain was put in place, they started sharing that information. Exporter, importer, content, route, uh, the uh, different uh, expediters who would be handling it and so on. And it was seen that the specific information that was not known until there was an actual disembarkation could wait and was less important to the security calculus than the information that was available well in advance of departure. And an incredible thing has been discovered jointly over the last year in which ACAS has been operating. As 70 million manifests have been processed, some minor fraction, less than 3,000 packages have actually been inspected. And a fraction of the 70 million have actually been referred, but when they are referred, they're being handled and the matter is being taken care of by dialogue between the private sector and the public sector so that any dispute about the nature of the risk presented is resolved before arrival at the port of entry, seaport, airport, or land port. So in effect, the security clearance has also become a customs clearance, which expedites the movement and avoids the holding and the delay of cargo once it arrives at the port of entry. So it was that experience that led me to start thinking about the implications of the grand bargain. How do we actually move to this idea that sharing information can both serve privacy and it can serve the expediting of lawful trade and travel? And the argu argument goes uh, something like this. In the past, the notion of information sharing was I take my data out of my database, I put it into a crate, metaphorically speaking, and I carry it over and I give it to you, and then much as a dump truck filled with data, I back it up and you dump it into your database. And that notion of bulk data sharing is what gives rise to the concerns, legitimate in my view, about the violation of privacy. Is that when a citizen has provided information, there is an expectation of privacy. Uh, and that expectation is violated, or certainly not observed, when you have this notion of data exchange in the, in, the, in the view of I give you my data, you give me your data, and we have access to it. information can be shared today does not involve the exchange of bulk data, but rather the development of joint rule sets that can then scan the data in an anonymous mask fashion and that the only information that is shared is where there is an alert that is responsive to the particular rule search that has been previously stipulated. When you think about data and information exchange in that manner, it seems to me that privacy actually is a boon to security along a couple of lines. First of all, the usual privacy regimes, which involve a concern with use, accuracy, and the capacity to redress inaccuracy, false positives, means that if we operate on this theory, we do not violate privacy because the data is masked, because it is actually scanned in an anonymous fashion, 
with the algorithms designed to ferret out alerts and alarms that can then be handled by protocols to look at those alerts and those alarms to see whether or not you're dealing with a false positive. Providing people with an opportunity to correct inaccurate data actually enhances the security profile uh, because the data is good and you avoid the garbage in, garbage out phenomenon. If this is correct, it seems to me then uh, we have the basis for a revolution in the way in which we exchange data. So the Department of Homeland Security, led by uh, Secretary Napolitano, entered into negotiations a while ago with the European Union regarding PNR data, passenger name rec rec records, passenger name records. And the concern of the Europeans was the violation of privacy and by extension of civil liberties. But if you look at uh, this new method of data exchange and information sharing, you actually avoid those concerns and you provide the basis for an expansion of information sharing that has revolutionary implications. And in fact, if you asked any European leader, wouldn't you want to know for every person moving toward a European airport, wouldn't you want to know what is known in the various governments of the world about that person? With the assurance that only that information would be shared and that it would be shared according to pre-agreed criteria and protocols. Would it have been that we would not in the United States have suffered 9-11 and that we would not have developed the databases that now exist? That is the way we used to look at uh, the issues of security and privacy. The fact of the matter is, notwithstanding the tragedy and the trauma of 9-11, the development of these databases and their multiplication in other centers around the world actually gives us the basis for expediting trade and heightening security without violating expectations or norms of privacy at all. To the contrary, if this argument is correct, building privacy protections into the data the compilation of it, the analysis of it, the exchange of it actually enhances security. And it's something that we should seek, not avoid. And I must tell you, coming from a law enforcement, corporate, private sector background, shutters did, until very recently, come down when the DHS privacy officer would come around wanting to look at the procedures within DHS, within CBP, for data management and data dissemination. Shutter would come down and I'd say, this is an obstacle. This is something that is antithetical to the function of security. I submit to you, ladies and gentlemen, that uh, I was wrong and that that reflexive reaction to the privacy officer's concern was misplaced. What I invite you to do is to take that kernel of an idea and help turn it into a theory of action that would do more than anything I can now perceive to build the information sharing globally with a global data mart that does not involve the dump truck of data, but rather the development of rule sets to look at known threats, but also to be able to scan data for unknown threats based on 
the kernels of intelligence that we get, which then can be converted into algorithms and searches that can help us actually identify within any group of cargoes or any group of persons that group that needs to be looked at further according to the pre-agreed and stipulated protocols that would ferret out high-risk cargo and high-risk persons. That's a, uh, an extension of the uh, proposition I ask you to consider. Let me uh, spend uh, the remaining time talking about uh, something all of us being geographically uh, so based uh, have a deep interest in and a deep passion for. And that is the uh, implications of lines and flows in that paradigm and prism for the U.S.-Mexico relationship. And while it is true that we need to continue to work through that, and we'll continue to do that over the next decades, what I'd like to do today is, uh, again, extend something that's hinted at in the paper, but offer you up a further platform for exploration and examination. So it has become clear that the relationship with Mexico and the United States is so fundamentally different, and I use that word advisedly, from what it was even five years ago, in part because of the amazing transformation in Mexico, but in part because of the amazing transformation in the view by opinion elites and governmental elites and private sector elites about Mexico and the critical importance of Mexico to the health, both economically and in terms of security, to the United States. So the cooperation taking place on the level in which most of us know having to do with law enforcement and crime and the threat of organized crime proceeded from a very basic realization in the United States, which is now a fundamental and cardinal tenet of our policy, which is that Mexico is critical to the national security of the United States in ways that dwarfs many of our other involvements and concerns. That in fact, the health of Mexico is not only a good thing, but in the hard, self-interested notions of statecraft, it's a necessary thing for the health of the United States and the security of the United States. Most of us who live on the U.S.-Mexico border came to that realization a generation ago. Indeed, Dr. Frost referred to something that uh, I wrote uh, in the Stanford Law Review called El Tercer País, the third country. But it was done at a time when Mexico and the United States were actually uh, engaged mostly in finger pointing. With the issues of migration and drugs, the notion was that it was the other's fault. The United States wanted the hypocritical uh, advantages of cheap labor and secure borders. Mexico and its economy could not support masses of young people who were compelled to seek a better life in the United States, but it was each the other's fault. With regard to drugs, it was the level of consumption in the United States that caused the problem. And from the American perspective, it was often Mexico's inability to control organized crime and its relationship in those years with the Colombia mafia that was at fault. And the dialogue was not much of a dialogue so much as a debate and a dispute. The situation today is so far different. In those years, what I endeavored to do is to try to take issues of common interest and avoid the dichotomy, 
So with regard to illegal immigration, the notion that every Mexican has the right to leave Mexico and every Mexican that enters the United States illegally commits a crime were two things that prevented very much of a dialogue between our countries, old and tired. And the notion was that we had a common interest in public safety and that if we stopped debating immigration and started to focus on public safety, we could actually accomplish a great deal, and we did. So that even 15 years ago, hundreds of uh, Mexican citizens fleeing up freeways through the ports of entry at San Isidro were being slaughtered on American freeways. Even today, there are, are the, the signs on the freeway speak back at a time when, in fact, the Mexican mother or father with her child was actually being hit by cars regularly on the California freeway. Once we started in those years to look at this as a matter of public safety, we could find cooperation, and we stopped that in the space of several months. And that does not happen, and has not happened for many years. But the relationship has gone so far beyond that to a new doctrine of co-responsibility. The declaration of President Calderon and President Obama in May 2010 of a 21st century border declaration created the intellectual and political basis for cooperation that now, I believe, has become the norm and will remain the norm over the next generation, which is that instead of pointing to each other's weaknesses, we recognize that the flow of drugs and migrants to the north and guns and cash to the south are part of one vicious cycle that needs to be confronted cooperatively. And indeed, what we have seen and what we will continue to see are the results of the policies under the doctrine of co-responsibility. What I want to uh, point out is uh, something that uh, Bayless Manning pointed out in the 1970s, which is that the relationship between the United States and Mexico is actually neither international in a classical sense, certainly U.S. relations with uh, Japan or Brazil or France are not the same relationships that we have with Mexico. It's not international in a classical sense. Nor is it domestic in a practical sense because we have separate sovereignties which is lay at the core and respect for those sovereignties is at the core of the doctrine of co-responsibility. So we don't have a domestic situation and we don't have an international situation. Bayless Manning coined the phrase intermestic. And intermestic is actually a useful way of looking at our relationship. What I'd like to explore in the remaining uh, moments today is the potential importance of that concept of our relationship with Mexico for the larger North American relationship. So in fact, both with Mexico and with Canada, we have the longest demilitarized borders in the history of the world. The United States is blessed on its northern border as well as on its southern border. Our relationship with Canada is intermestic. And the traditional histor historical issues with Canada were no less touchy, although they were very different from the way in which it played out in our relationships with Mexico. Canada has always said how different its border is with us from what our border is with Mexico. But in fact, uh, not so different uh, in the suspicion of Canadians about the Colossus on the north. So while it was uh, Porfirio Diaz who said uh, before the Mexican Revolution, poor Mexico, 
so far from God and so close to the United States. Uh, Canadians have actually felt the same way. And they had their own way of expressing it. In a remarkable development, not as well known as the Calderon-Obama Declaration for the 21st Century Order, in February 2011, Prime Minister Harper and President Obama issued uh, a declaration called Beyond the Border, a uh, vision for uh, a perimeter uh, a security and economic competitiveness. And this, in fact, was a uh, recognition uh, by the Canadians and the Americans that uh, what we needed to do in the global world that was emerging with blocks was very much what has been driving our relationship here between Mexico and the United States, which is that if we are to be secure and if we are to be economically competitive with East Asia and Brazil and the Indian subcontinent, the frame of reference that we needed to develop more and more is a North American one. That we need to see Canada, the United States, Mexico, and in due course Central America until Darien, and possibly including Colombia, as being part of a North American entity which needs to be developed so that we can actually enhance our security and our economic competitiveness. Ladies and gentlemen, 5,500 miles of border on the land side between Canada and the United States, including the border between the Yukon and Alaska. 1,900 miles of Mexican-U.S. border with which we are more familiar. But it is clear from a strategic point of view, I think, that the defense of the United States, speaking from a U.S. perspective, is better calculated on a perimeter basis than it is by thinking that we can actually build the marginal line on the land borders between Canada and the United States and between Mexico and the United States. That in fact, when we begin to use the advanced information regime by pre-clearing passengers who get on airplanes in Frankfurt that once cleared by a tri-national function, a North American immigration or customs function, that persons and cargoes would be admitted into North America. Now we are a generation from that, from that point, if indeed we can ever reach it. But the strategic concept and the idea is something that I would commend to you to think about. What we discovered in the 1950s, for example, when faced with the threat of the Cold War, was that missiles coming from the Soviet Union over the North Pole toward the United States and Canada could not be defended except by a joint air defense. And that was the genesis of NORAD. Not because Canadians were so eager to actually be joint, but because they recognized that in fact, faced with ICBMs, there could be no defense were it not joined. I submit to you that over time, uh, we need to think about and perhaps move toward NORAD borders that look at the entity of interest on a North American basis. We will end up not only with more security, but we will end up with greater economic competitiveness. Because if we are to compete in the maquiladores in Mexicali, or in Tijuana, or in Juarez, or in Matamoros, if we are to compete with the auto plants in Ontario, 
with the manufacturing and productive capacities of the Indian subcontinent or Brazil or China and East Asia, we must in fact not attempt to compete on the basis of wage rates, but rather in terms of efficient borders. We can drive down the costs of transactions at our borders by 10 to 20 percent. Those of you engaged in cross-border commerce know that. We need to do that to be economically competitive and also to enhance our security. El futuro ya no es lo que era antes. The future is not what it used to be. So let me uh, share with you one development that shows that we are not so far away as perhaps the projection suggests. There are negotiations going on now between the United States and Canada and between the United States and Mexico that would create the capacity for cargoes to be pre-inspected by U.S. officers operating in the host country that would pre-inspect cargo and permit that cargo once pre-inspected to move across the border without stopping at the port of entry. So I want you to imagine it not being so far away that a truck filled with auto parts manufactured in southern Ontario will drive to a auto plant in Puebla, Guanajuato, without stopping at either land border. This is something that is on the drawing board, not merely a figment of one's imagination. When we take that and we multiply it across the sectors of trade and travel, you will see a North America that will remain at the center of world affairs for the next 300 years. Lacking that, world history is yet to be predicted. The key to Mexicans, the key to Americans, the key to Canadians, the key to Central Americans is the geography that we share. Thank you very much.